Good morning and welcome to this virtual service. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. We invite you now to settle yourself, quiet yourself, perhaps light a candle, and let's turn our hearts and our minds to the focus of Almighty God. As we have done in the last number of weeks, this morning we present a sermon from the past with the intention of uploading the Monongahela service as it's recorded this morning, later today. Join together in our call to worship. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth, all, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Here our call to confession. What a gift we have in the Word of God. Some of the faithful who went before us, as well as brothers and sisters in some area of the world today, have given their very lives because of the high value they placed on the Word of God. What about us? Do we treasure the Scriptures? Join together in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, your word tells us that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Forgive us for the days we have failed to even open the scriptures 
trusting in our own wisdom instead. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us for the times we have read the scriptures hastily as if to check a completion box and then completely forgotten what we read. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us when we know exactly what the word says, yet we choose to ignore it because it does not fit in with our own thoughts or desires. Lord, have mercy. Forgive us when we have chosen to use the word as a club to accuse others rather than as a light for our own pathway. Lord, have mercy. Write your word on our hearts, Lord, that we may be transformed from the inside out. Lord, have mercy and write your word on our hearts. Amen. Hear this assurance of our pardon. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, our fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation, the spirit of life in Christ. Like a strong wind has cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entering the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could not have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. Now what the law code asks for, but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we embrace what the Spirit is doing in us.
Let's come to our Lord in a time of prayer. Gracious God, for some of us, this has felt like a short week, a week that's gone by without any complications and quickly, or sometimes rushed and hurried. For others of us, it's been a long week, a week of waiting, a week of wanting things to happen faster than they are. Lord, we need you. We need you now more than ever. We ask that you would direct our hearts and our minds towards you, and that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would bring to us renewal and refreshment, peace and joy. You remind us in your word that you are faithful to carry our burdens. Help us to lay those before you. You tell us that you will renew our strength and you promise to give us rest as we come to you. Let us take you up on that and do that. Forgive us for the times when we have worked so hard to try to be self-sufficient, forgetting our need for you, trying to live independent of your spirit Forgive us for letting our fears and our worries control our minds and allowing pride and self selfishness to wreak havoc over our lives. Forgive us for not following your ways and for living at a distance from your presence. Thank you, Lord, because in you we know that your ways are so much greater than ours, that your thoughts are deeper than ours. Thank you that you have a plan to redeem us and that you're making all things new and that your face is close to and right alongside those who, bro who are broken hearted and that you know each of our hearts. Thank you for your daily presence in our lives. That we can be assured that no matter what we're facing, that your heart is towards us, your eyes are over us, and your ears are open to hearing our cries. Surround us with your favor. Place a shield before us that we are safe in your care. We give you praise for you alone are our Lord, and you are holy and just, and your loving kindness endures forever. Help us never to take for granted this huge gift of love that you have given to us and offered to us. Help us to be reminded of the cost of it all. Forgive our busyness, our distractedness, our lack of fully recognizing what you have given to us and what you have done for us. Help us to cease striving and remember alone that you are our God. We've come close to you, Lord. We ask that you would walk with us and give us your wisdom and your purpose to stay strong and true. We pray, Lord, for your protection over our lives, over the lives of our families, over the lives of every person in this world, every part of your creation, every corner of it. We ask, Lord, for your hand to cover and keep each one of us distant from the evil, from the evil intent of the enemy, and that you would be our refuge, that you would give us discernment and insight beyond our years to understand your will, to know your voice, and to walk in your ways, that we would keep our footsteps firm on solid ground, and that we'd help others to be consistent too in their faithfulness. We pray for supernatural endurance to stay the course, not swerving to the right or to the left or being too easily distracted by other things that we would draw close in that walk with you. Shine your light on us, through us, over us. May we make a difference in this world for your glory so that your purpose would stand. Set your ways before us. And may we reflect your peace and your hope in the world. We pray particularly for those in our congregation that are struggling with grief and sorrow this day. 
We lift up those who are recovering from hospital stays, those awaiting testing, those awaiting procedures. We ask that you would particularly have your hands upon them and upon those who are providing the medical care. We pray, Lord, in this time of fatigue for so many that you would be particularly present to those in our medical community, that you would give them the additional reserves they need for the tasks that you have called them to be about. We pray for the leaders of nations, for the leaders of our country, for cooperation, for a common commitment to the common good. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would uh, bless and watch over your church family, that you would strengthen each part of us, that you would knit us together in greater ways in the family that you have made us to be, a family of faith. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, for we are now more than conquerors through the gift of your love through us and in us made possible in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We wonder how many obituaries in the newspaper should actually read like this. Robert Jackson died yesterday after a lifetime of doing junk that he really didn't want to do. His condition was further complicated because he failed to do much, if anything, that he did want to do. Experts reported that he died 20 years too early from cramming someone else's ideas of life into his brain, his body, and his everyday being. Attempts by Mr. Jackson to fill the void with work or with cars or with excess eating or alcohol or wives or girlfriends or 
meeting someone else's expectations, or ignoring his wife and kids while being in front of the TV, were all dismal failures and unsuccessfully successful. Miserable in the last years, he passed away unpeacefully yesterday at his home. He was surrounded by colleagues from work that he hated and were after his job and family members who were just as miserable as he was. Can people really change? That's the question. Can life really be different than what it is right now? If you walk into a bookstore, or more likely these days, look on Amazon, you'll find self-help titles shouting at you. What should I do with my life? You can heal your life. You can be happy no matter what. Controlling people or controlling people. Outer, order, inner calm. A food science book that we ran, a call, ran across called How Not to Die, The Miracle Morning. If you do a Google search of the most popular self-help book, what you get to come back is not just one book, but a list of the top 30 self-help books. You see, there are a lot of people out there trying to sell you an answer based on taking control of your life, getting your own needs met, building your self-confidence. But really, why would you believe you could change by putting confidence in yourself? I mean, you and I both know that we're fallible, we're easily tempted. And this is the topic of countless conversations and debate, ongoing conversations with friends, inside marriages, sometimes just in passing, oh yeah, he or she is never going to change. To that nearly desperate or downright despairing plea, this is never going to change. My life is always going to be this way. The question is, is it really possible to change human nature? And if we ask that, there are really two groups. One group of people who are impatient with their own progress, and those who are frustrated by the progress of others. But you can't change by sheer willpower. Look at the trail of broken New Year's resolutions every single year. Those unused exercise machines, that diet book that has already gotten dusty. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different change or outcome. Plus our frustration of trying to change someone else, which never works, leaves us with the belief that people really can't change. Well, we have to tell you that that's wrong. Can people change? Well, it's not much of a sermon if we say <laughs> no. It's going to say, go on your way and your miserable life and you know heaven's going to be a lot better. Yes, absolutely, positively. We've witnessed it in our lives and other people's lives, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit as we believe in Jesus Christ. Also, not much of a sermon if we say, yes, we can change and just go along in your life and be a better Christian and just try harder. As we prayed about this sermon and we read God's word and we studied, here's what really broke through to us, revolutionized how we thought about this issue of change. We tend to think of our true selves as the way we appear, the way we've known ourselves and others to be. That's why believing that someone or ourselves or someone else can go from being hot-tempered or indifferent or unaffectionate or frustrating or compulsive or addicted to substances, they can't change, it's impossible because these things are really who they are, who they've always been. And we think that we've got that totally backward and wrong. Look with us at how God created us because that's who we truly are. He knew us before the world was formed. He prepared us to do wonderful things. He made us in his image. He delights in us. We're priceless. 
We people were created by God, all the intended wholeness that we've just distorted. How can we change ourselves? Well, the answer is that we can't. Only Christ can by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The goal of human nature is to be truly human, fully human. The glory of Christ is a person fully alive, reaching full potential, recreated in Christ's image. Whatever we do or have done to escape or distort what God created us to be ends up in sin and inhumanity. Selfishness, self-centeredness makes us less than the human beings that God says that we are. The only way to change human nature is to remove the distortions. In a nutshell, outside Christ, our fallen nature is in rebellion against God. We seek to run our own lives. This results in pride and anger and self-absorption and hostility and competitiveness. When Christ takes hold of our life, he makes us more human. It's a huge difference. It's not that we have to change the basics of who we are. It's that we have to get rid of all of the stuff we've put and distorted on top of the original person. It's throwing out all the junk, all the things that happened to us or that we did, things that God added on. It's a falsehood that to become more like Christ is to be spiritual or less human. God created us in our bodies in this world. So often we think that to become a Christian, we have to take on some kind of super pious mentality. But what we end up with is not humanness, but an escape from it. As we become more like him, we don't become some angelic being hovering between heaven and earth. We become human beings, compassionate, perceptive, feeling, caring, loving people. The reproduction of Christ's character in us enables us to be authentically human. Our human nature is returned to its original. It's like the analogy of a beautiful painting, a masterpiece, a piece of art that has been painted over and seemingly has a different picture and is, is useless by comparison. This is a process that we now see in the mirror dimly but then we'll see face to face. Can people really change? Well, we've done it. We've changed the original that God gave us to begin with. That's the point. There's a huge difference between trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, so to speak, and to reclaim what is already there. Try this metaphor. Let's say we're talking about your house. And what you really, really want is an intricate hardwood floor. And what you have is an orange shag carpet. Now, if you love orange shag carpets, just play along. This is an old orange shag carpet. You can see that in your head. It's stained with heaven knows what. The dog's peed on it. You got the picture. Does this image, though, look like any part of your life? Well, if you're honest, and if we are, yeah, it does. It's a process that there's something underneath that. And so you strip off the orange carpeting. And then you take up the linoleum, and then the plywood, and then the subflooring, and then the paint to reveal that gorgeous inlaid hardwood floor that was there to begin with. But we can't just sit around and say, yep, I've got a fabulous parquet floor underneath that floor right there. No, you have to get up. You have to participate in what the Holy Spirit is seeking to do in you. It's important to remember that it's the Holy Spirit giving the power that's going to change us, that's going to make that restoration happen. It is he who began a good work in us, who will see it through to completion, Scripture says. 
God won't give up on his purpose to make us perfect. Make no mistake, though, you can't do it yourself. It actually isn't a DIY project that you can YouTube or watch on some television show. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. We are to do and to seek godly wisdom and approach that in participating in this transformation of our very selves. Nothing against those self-help books or books about change, about transformation. We read lots of Christian books about transformation. But the focus can't be on ourselves or getting your own needs met. The focus has to be on the right person, on God, and growing into all the things that Christ has made you to be. And then those behavioral change-up tips that you might read in a self-help book, well, they might help along the way to shed some of the junk. Mm -hmm. But our focus, the power, is based on a scriptural truth, like what you might say, that Christ is the center, the foundation of the universe, and it's not me, it's not you, it's not our needs, it's not our wants, it's not our desires. That we are created so precious and so gifted and so loved by our Father and Savior that we can scarcely imagine that when we believe in Jesus Christ and let him have reign over our lives, that we are given by the coming and the living of the Holy Spirit all that awesome power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Not a sliver of it, not a smidgen of it, all of it. And so then there is no situation, no person that is hopeless. We look at the metaphor of a house, for instance, that there are some rooms in your house or mine that maybe we keep for company or we have them closer to perfect so they're ready for company to come in. But there are other places that only certain people, especially family, see. We have to be willing to do the hard work to change, wanting something to be different, but not willing to do the hard work. We have to be willing to do the hard work. And so it's not so much that I do it, is that I take away the walls, uh, right. the obstacles, and the disobedience to the Spirit doing the work. It's not so much that I'm going to set to work to make myself a more loving and wonderful wife. It's that I'm going to be more obedient to God's Word and less self-centered. Look, I know reality. I know what it's like to say um, husbands and wives and family members and friends just looking in the mirror at ourselves. This feels or can feel hopeless. He's never going to change. She's never going to love me. He cares about himself and only himself. Why won't she listen or care or respond? He's never going to stay sober. She's never going to stay clean. She's always going to care more about and on and on and on. But God's words are practical and powerful and effective. We're, we're called to first open up those rooms or closets or areas of our lives, and we all know what that is, to the power of the Spirit to do the hard work of cleaning out the junk. We take hope and encouragement from the truth that if one person makes a change, then the whole system changes. Everything changes when even one person starts to change. And that we don't get to go into other people's lives and change them or rearrange them. It's important and crucial to remember that we can help and hold others accountable as they choose to change. But nothing that we do can make someone else change. We're responsible for only for ourselves. Consider this. If God has put something in your life if you're living in God's will, he has created and he can see a beautiful, whole, priceless reality that maybe you can't see. In your marriage, in your family, in your relationship, in your friends, and what you're called to do. And even if you've never seen this dream fully that God has called you to, even if you haven't had one solid, wonderful moment, if God has seen it, if he's called that out for you, then you have to believe it and trust it and cherish it and allow yourself to be transformed.
Now, mostly we don't change because we don't want to do the hard work or we're comfortable or we're afraid of changing and we like the status quo. We say, oh, better the devil we know. But we believe the distortion instead of the truth. Pretty much most of us, if not all of us, believe in the power of words to shape a person. We've been told that if a person is raised being told that they're stupid or ugly or unwanted or lazy or whatever, that we internalize those words. And then we live as if we're stupid or unlovable or whatever. We all know this. Words have power if we let them. Even more so, so much more so, is the power of the word, God's word. We chose the song immediately before the scripture this morning, not by accident. Ancient words, ever true, we just sang, changing me, changing you. It's amazing to stand and think of the power of those words that we just sang. The life-affirming, believing, hoping, counting on that these words will change us and change others. And so how? You pray for God to illuminate just one area of your life, one small place to stand in a new way. And then you ask us or another Christian friend into that change to pray, to hold you accountable, and also to show you God's grace. And you believe in the electrifying, knock your socks off power of the Holy Spirit. It is a process. We believe in those words that say, God, I'm not what all that I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I once was. And we hear the word and they change us. And so we shake off the dust and we walk out of our history and we quit being an indifferent, self-absorbed parody of the car or caricature of the person that God created us to be. We hear and we call you to hear the life-changing words that you are blessed that there is nothing that you can't do, that in all things, God gives you the power. Nothing is impossible for God. And he says, you are blessed and you are mine. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. All right. Join in our affirmation of faith. We rejoice in the goodness of God renounce the works of darkness, and dedicate ourselves to holy living. As covenant partners called to faithful obedience and set free for joyful praise, we offer our hearts and lives to do God's work in his world. With tempered impatience, eager to see injustice ended, we expect the day of the Lord, and we are confident that the light which shines in the present darkness will fill the earth when Christ appears. Come, Lord Jesus. Our world belongs to you.
And now join in this responsive benediction. We have waited patiently for God, and he has heard our cry. He has set our feet on solid ground and kept us steady as we journey together. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.